Uh, good morning. And this week, rather than hearing me lecture, we are going to have a conversation with my uh, friend and former colleague, uh, Jim McGarry. Uh, and Jim, today we're actually going to be looking at a chapter which I think most people either skim or completely skip, which is uh, the first chapter of the Gospel <clears throat> of Matthew. Um, it's if anybody wants to turn to it, right? It's the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And the whole rest of the chapter is very much a list of names as we've seen uh, previously in the Hebrew Bible. So can you tell me, Jim, a little bit about this chapter and why it's worth considering? Sure, uh, <clears throat> and it's great to be here. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, you wouldn't think that uh, if, if you're here to talk about the Bible and literature, that a genealogy would be particularly literate. I mean, it's, it's uh, or literary, I should say. It is uh, a list. And, you know, most people just kind of get to the bottom where they've established in this genealogy, this, this series of, um, <clears throat> of uh, well, really paternity, right? Yeah. Um, and lineage. But in this culture, as in many, it's a lineage through the father. Um, and uh, most people like to get to the bottom, which mentions, you know, Jesus. Basically, the, the gist of it is uh, Jesus descends uh, into the house of David, from the house of David, and, uh, and is born of Mary. But you see, that's very unusual to actually name Jesus as son of Mary, which is what this uh, genealogy says. Um, and um, actually it says in Matthew, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus yeah. was born. But even to mention her, you see, you normally, as you'll, you'll notice in here, it's almost all men, many of them with very difficult names to pronounce. Um, however, if you read carefully, there are a total of five women mentioned in this genealogy and uh that is very unusual and everyone who heard this would have understood that that was unusual would have been surprised to hear those names and as we get into the names a little bit uh, uh you'll you'll understand better yeah so so yeah. um dr delaport can i Go forward with some of those names or yeah yeah go forward start us from the top i'd love to have the students notice these names because i think otherwise you just sort of skim over them and they're just difficult yes. names. well yeah. if, if you can perhaps make me co-host i can share screen and wealth of this story is that the each of these five women uh have uh intricate uh stories and it's a great introduction to the Hebrew scriptures itself. And uh, I, I apologize for having this on a Microsoft Word document, but, uh, or on a Word document here, but um, rather than slideshow. At any rate, the first one is Tamar. And I'm introducing you here with a couple of, of uh, artworks, uh, both uh, uh, a piece from Chagall and a piece from uh, 19th century artist, Emile Vernet. Um, but basically, and I'll use Tamar as an example because I won't, I'll let you uh, explore the other stories. I'll, I'll overview them quickly, but Tamar is, is uh, worth mentioning. And by the way, my, my awkward title here, Women on and with an Edge in the Biblical Narrative. Um, uh, these women aren't uh, just victims, uh, although most of them are victims in some ways. Uh, they are also uh, showing their agency uh, in getting what they need to survive and to thrive uh, in these ancient times. So uh, you may have already studied the story of Leveret marriage, uh, which uh, says that in a family, when the uh, oldest son dies, any um, <clears throat> unmarried son, second son, if he's unmarried, uh, has to marry the widow and that the children are the children of the oldest son. And this was Tamar's situation. Her husband was killed. Uh, the, the narrative tells us that it was because he was a bad guy and God just smote him. Um, the, um, 
uh, the second son, knowing the Leverett custom, doesn't actually want to have his brother's children. His name is Onan, and he rather notoriously uh, practices coitus interruptus, spills his seed on the ground, and uh, and he is killed uh, by God for that uh, terrible sin and and the violation of the the sexual and uh, uh, relation relationship politics of the time where he was supposed to do his duty um then the father gets spooked judah's the father by the way and judah's one of the sons of jacob and and one of the chiefs of the one of the 12 tribes of israel and so judah gets spooked and um there he is in the background there of uh chagall's piece but uh uh instead of offering his third son whose name is shelah uh he says oh he's too young please go back to your own dad your own parents house and uh and wait until he's a little bit older but then even as he gets older judah finds ways to postpone the marriage he actually feels that um he blames his son's death on tamar he feels she's bad luck so this is very <clears throat> uh important especially in these ancient tribal times i mean this was a matter of life and death it was um a, a, one of the reasons that the woman gets the father's name is that uh she's becoming she's become part of his family and she has left her own family and her own name behind and uh it's actually it, it, if families are experiencing marginal um uh, times uh, hunger and uh, the rest uh, it's very difficult to take back an adult into the family that you've already paid a dowry to give to another family so anyway she does go back with her father but then she wants her rights and when she um, hears that Judah's going on his wife dies uh, Judah's wife dies and he's going on a trip she hears about it and she positions herself on the road as a prostitute veiling her face as Chagall has it here uh, and as Bernay has it here. Um, and uh, she um, uh, has sex with Judah and Judah actually offers to have sex with her and pays her. Um, but it's a very interesting payment. It, it involves his family seal and, um, uh, and, and a goat that's branded um, uh, with the family seal so um <clears throat> the family trademark and um and uh, judah goes on his way and then tamar uh, was able to get pregnant she shows up pregnant in the social circles and she is immediately condemned judah himself threatens to burn her even though he has tried to marginalize her she's still part of his family and he threatens to burn her alive and it's a very gruesome um and uh uh, spate of anger that he he demonstrates but then of course she has the trump card which is the goat and and the other symbols of uh, judah's family and so uh she establishes that judah indeed was the one who impregnated her and uh, she is now carrying uh, the child that she wanted to have within the family and uh it's um and she survives by those wits right by that wiliness and uh, by that agency. So now that's an example of one story here. Um, and, and all of them involved this edge of reproductive um, uh, precariousness. Um, and um, so we're really looking at sexual politics here. And so I just want to invite you um, to uh, uh, use this document as you will and uh, look at the case of Rahab, who was a Canaanite woman, not a Hebrew, uh, but she helped the Hebrews get themselves uh, established in the Canaanite kingdom. And uh, she herself was a prostitute, probably very poor. One of the most interesting parts of her agency is that she, when she gets invited to join the Hebrews because helping them do this espionage, um, she makes sure that her whole family comes along. And I love this more contemporary picture of her, uh, both for her, her dark features and also her age. This is probably a representation of her later, you know, as she brought in uh, her whole family and established herself with these, uh, perhaps uh, attracted by the, the 
Exodus story, the, the freedom story, because the Canaanite kingdom was a very hierarchical <clears throat> place. Anyway, uh, I'll move on. <clears throat> Ruth, of course, is probably more well known to some of you. I love this portrait from Landell. <clears throat> um, and here she is um, with the mother, uh, her mother-in-law, the famous story of her staying with her mother-in-law. And of course, here gleaning in the fields, a very dangerous um, thing that the poor do, did. Um, but it was also a social safety net to come after the harvesters. And so the story of Ruth, she's mentioned in the genealogy. Okay, she's the, the um, uh, third woman. And then finally, before Mary, is um, Bathsheba. And, and most people do know this story, too. Um, and I invite you to, to follow this, um, the uh, scriptures that I have put for each one of these. Um, I like the Rembrandt particularly because uh, there's a lot of controversy about Bathsheba. Was she an opportunist? You know, did she, whoa, wow, I get to, you know, be the king's concubine. Um, the sadness that's seen on her face here is important when she gets the news that the king wants to see her. Um, she knows what this is about. And she's thinking perhaps of her husband. Her husband is this, one of the most noble uh, figures in scripture, <clears throat> Uriah, also a foreigner, a Hittite, um, David tries to cover the impregnation uh, of Bathsheba by inviting um, Uriah home from the front lines to sleep with his wife, so it'll look like he impregnated her, uh, but uh, he's a soldier, and there's a, a code where even if the general calls you back or the commander-in-chief calls you back, you, you, um, you don't return to your home because your soldiers in the field can't do that. And so in solidarity with them, you don't. So that doesn't work, of course. So David kills him, has him killed in battle by Joab, his general. So um, a rather famous story of rape and treachery. Um, and uh, Bathsheba, as shown in the second more contemporary piece by uh, Diane uh, Voynetsi, um, you know, she lost a, a husband of great honor and virtue, and she's stuck with uh, a greedy uh, and selfish, uh, power-hungry king. Uh, but she also expresses her agency, as you get in the second uh, verses here uh, in, in um, chapter 12, you'll see her making sure that even though her first son dies, the one uh, impregnated on that day of rape, um, she became pregnant that day, um, uh, Solomon becomes king. Uh, and she is very much a part of making sure that happens because David has many wives. Um, and and I'll stop there, but just note some a couple of interesting sources uh, for you um, that might be helpful. Um, the third one, uh, the book, uh, this was very, very influential book for both Dr. Delaporte and myself, um, Phyllis Tribble's Texts of Terror. And that really started this kind of reading of, of the Bible. So uh, again, uh, sometimes a list is more than a list. Uh, the genealogy has some extraordinary stories uh, in it of women who are both on the edge and almost marginalized, but they, um, they, they make their way into uh, this great legacy of freedom uh, that we know uh, from the people of the Exodus. And um, they weren't saints, very clearly, but they had a promise and they uh, pursued it. And these women are a large part of that pursuit. So thank you for your attention to this. And Dr. Delaporte, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, want, I have a, a couple quite more questions, I guess, follow-up questions for you on this, just to just sort mm -hmm. of wrap it up, because these women seem to all be victims, but also really survivors and yes. to be able to just do amazing work. Do you think that they were added here? I mean, we have Mary's obviously the last of these women. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit how she might be a survivor in, 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 in around stories of reproduction as well? Because all of these yes. women are wow. stories of reproduction. Can you sort of um, tie her into why these women might have been chosen to be the ones Mentioned. Of course, yes. Thank you. That's yeah. that's so important, and and yeah. the whole this whole genealogy was redacted this way with these women in it, edited edited in uh, to make a point about Mary because the first century um, slander about Mary was that she was 
uh, simply uh, either a whore who got uh, impregnated by perhaps a Roman soldier who was occupying Palestine at the time. Uh, she was not a woman of woman of virtue. She has this story about an angel, but uh, everyone saw it as just another prematurely pregnant teenage girl, uh, which you, by the way, have the um, right uh, uh, under ancient law to uh, kill, to stone to death. I mean, there's a verse in Luke that says Mary ran in haste from Be from uh, Nazareth to the hill country of of uh, <clears throat> Uh, of Judah uh, to uh, her her cousin Elizabeth, it, it, in haste is not a uh, unimportant term. There, it's very important. She was running for her life, you see, and and she goes for great this great moment of solidarity with her cousin, who's who's also newly pregnant at the end of her uh, fertility cycle as an older woman, um, having experienced also judgment. God must be punishing you for something, Elizabeth because you can't get pregnant. So this was the politics of reproduction in, in uh, ancient times, bookended by these, these two women. And um, uh, th this pregnancy was a scandal. I mean, Joseph, in Matthew, Joseph insists on uh, divorcing Mary because that's what you do when this happens, but doing it quietly so perhaps she can avoid being killed because it was... It was an allowable penalty, but obviously not every family uh, did it that way. But these women were um, were marginalized for sure uh, if they became pregnant outside their their arranged marriage. And so Mary has this great uh, ignominy to um, overcome, and and the the early Christians have it to overcome. And the Roman world condemned her. Um, and um, and tried to tried to eviscerate the um, Christian story by claiming that this this part of its origin was particularly suspect that Jesus was a bastard, that Jesus was illegitimate, and of course, it's so important what we do. That's historically in the narrative. Um, that's what uh, everyone in the first century understood the the genealogy to be an attempt to restore. Uh, the uh, nobility of Jesus in spite of this cloud hanging over his mother. Um, but of course, theologically, it's very important for us to, uh, if you're interested in, in doing something different with that, which is to suggest in the theology of the incarnation, which is Christian belief that uh, God became a human, um, that, that uh, God's plan was for uh, this human to be on the margins himself and almost an infant mortality statistic. You know, we romanticize the stable that Jesus was born in, but actually, of course, uh, uh, out in the cold with no midwife around, uh, this was a recipe for disaster uh, because he was, the family was turned away from all the relatives' houses in Bethlehem. So um, at any rate, um, uh, uh, there, there's something of the identity of God in these women, you see, uh, if you look at it theologically, and I encourage you to, to pursue that. Yeah, that's wonderful, Jim. Thank you so much. I think there's a lot for students to uh, look at here, and, and hopefully from now on, when they see this genealogy, they'll stop and think about who these women are and go back and look at them. So this is really Yeah, helpful. explore these yeah. women's stories. They're, they're incredible. Thank you, Jim. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dr. Delport. Yeah. Thank you.